Hello, everyone. Wishing you all a very happy new year on behalf of our team, which is Oracle Cloud Customer Enablement Team. Today, we are kicking off the new season of our Devon and Beyond series with some standard and some new topics. It's all based on the feedback we received from you guys last year. So session time and days will remain the same. So for this webinar series, you'll see us here every first and third Tuesday till the end of this year. And for those who are new, let me give you a quick overview of the Devon and Beyond program. These sessions take you through a series of topics and activities related to understanding cloud, understanding Oracle Cloud, the technology behind it, and building out on Oracle Cloud. Devon and Beyond is hosted on Cloud Customer Connect, which is our Oracle community forum for end users. If you have not already, I invite you to create a free account on Cloud Customer Connect, join in discussions, ask questions, and look for upcoming events on various topics. I'm Renu Bhatt. I'm program lead with the customer enablement team. And today I'm joined by cloud engineers, Olivia Furda and Uma Kumar. Lynn Lewis will be joining us as a panelist. He'll be helping us answer the questions that you have. So today we'll go over the fundamentals of Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, best way to start the year with understanding cloud. So we'll be talking about cloud concepts, core services, features, and just to get you started on your cloud journey. With that, I will hand it over to Olivia. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Rainio. So hello, everyone. Welcome to today's session, getting started with Oracle Cloud Infrastructure. So I'll be taking you through the first portion of today's presentation, just kind of giving you an overview of Oracle Cloud. And then Uma will be taking you through the second portion, so some of the key services. And then we will also have a demo at the end. One thing I want to note before diving into today's session is we do have our course series here. So we do have these webinars that cover different topics in the cloud, but we also do have some other series as part of day one and beyond that you can explore. So we have our hands-on series. So if you want more of a hands-on approach, we do have that. We also do have cloud native and our cloud security series. So after this presentation, if you want to learn a little bit more, we will have this deck where you can click these links. And then also on our day one and beyond page, they should be linked there as well. All right, so diving into what we will be covering today. So I'll be taking you through the foundations of OCI. So some key concepts, terminology, or just things to keep in mind when you're first getting started. And when I say OCI, that's Oracle Cloud Infrastructure. So just kind of a shorter way of saying that. And then we'll dive into some key OCI services. So identity access management, networking, compute, storage, because these are all key features and tools of working in OCI. And then at the end, we do have a demo just to kind of show you around the console and a tool such as compute. And then also at the end, we'll dive into Q&A. But if you have any questions throughout the session, we will be answering those in the Q&A box as well. All right, so by the end of this presentation, you should have a building block of OCI and some of the foundations of that, such as regions, available domains, fault domains, and also implement security tools. So we'll cover identity access management and some other features as well. And then we'll dive into some of the core services like networking, compute, storage, and database. All right, so diving into the foundations of OCI is just to kind of give you an overview. All right, so one thing to be aware of is you have on-prem and you'll see that we also have these different layers right here going from IaaS or infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and SaaS or software as a service. So as you go through these different um, layers right here, you'll see that the customer responsibility decreases as you go to the right and the cloud service provider responsibility increases. So that's Oracle in this case. And that just depends on your security and compliance um, needs or responsibilities, but just one thing to be aware of when working in um, OCI. All right, so all these services right here are built on the OCI platform and are integrated together. So for example, if you wanted to deploy an application, you're gonna start with a virtualized compute instance, attach to storage, and then deploy within a VCN. And then the application can store the data within a database. So that's just kind of an example of using these different features. 
But in today's session, we'll be focusing on giving you an overview of compute, storage, networking, the Oracle databases. So just kind of an overview of these different services, but um, that's just kind of an example of how you can use those uh, services together. All right, so going into regions, so it's just kind of a map of our different regions that we have available. So you can see um, right here, as of December, 2023, we have 48 regions, um, four more plans, 12 Azure interconnect regions. So you can see all this listed here. And what regions are, are there localized geographic areas where you can choose to host your workload? So regions are independent of other regions and they can be separated by vast distances across countries or even continents. And we also have that Azure Interconnect, which is Oracle's dedicated connection to Microsoft Azure to give you that low latency or private connectivity. And you can see it mapped out in this legend right here. And generally you would deploy an application in the region where it is most heavily used because using nearby resources is faster than using distant resources. However, you can also deploy applications in different regions for reasons such as maybe to mitigate the risk of region-wide events, maybe like such as large weather systems or earthquakes, um, or maybe to meet varying requirements for legal jurisdictions, tax domains, and other business or social criteria. So that's a little bit of an overview of regions and kind of the most um, up to date as of December, 2023, the regions available. Now let's dive into a little bit more of a region and kind of what that looks like in OCI because it really is um, a building block. So OCI is gonna be hosted in regions and availability domains. And while a region is a localized geographic area, an availability domain contains one or more data centers. And then a region is composed of one or more availability domains. And so you'll see we have these availability domains down here. And these are isolated from each other, fault tolerant, and very unlikely to fail simultaneously because these availability domains do not share infrastructure such as power cooling or the internal availability domain network. And then on top of that, you also do have these fault domains, so you'll see that right here. And this is a grouping of hardware and infrastructure within an availability domain or an AD. And each AD contains three fault domains. And these fault domains let you distribute your instances so that they're not on the same physical hardware within a single availability domain. And most OCI resources are gonna be either region specific, such as a virtual cloud network or availability domain specific, such as a compute instance. So just one thing to keep in mind. Um, also, once again, why it kind of is one of the building blocks of working in OCI. And you also have that encrypted interconnect between your different ADs or availability domains. All right, so kind of just building on top of our data centers or these availability domains right here. You also have this physical network. So the available domains within the same region are connected to each other by a low latency, high bandwidth network, which makes it possible for you to provide high availability connectivity to the internet and on-prem, or to build replicated systems and multiple available domains for both high availability and disaster recovery. You also have the virtual network. So off-box network virtualization allows us to put all the virtualization out to the network. So enables the next layer up so we can take any physical form factor and plug that into our virtual network. And then at the very top, you'll see all of our different services right here. Um, so it kind of just shows us the different technologies that are included in your environment. So we're able to use these side-by-side -side due to off-box virtualization. So it's gonna allow us to plug these into our environment without making any changes. Otherwise we would have to bring in a hypervisor on engineer systems such like Exadata to make it work. All right, so when you very first get um, started 
and OCI, we just kind of want to walk you through some key things and components to keep in mind. So right here, you'll see Vision Corp, and this is just our mock company, and we'll be kind of building off of this diagram to piece together the different tools or features that we discussed today. But you'll see right here, we have our region. This is the Ashburn region. We have our availability domains. And then you're also going to start off with your root compartment. And so this is pretty important, and I'll be diving into kind of what this is um, in a few moments. And then you also have your users. All right, so going into an overview of OCI services. So it's very important to keep security in mind when you're working in the cloud. And one of the foundations of this in OCI is this identity piece. And this is where we're going to be discussing um, some of the features there today but very important to first organize your resources, control access to those resources. Um, very important, this identity piece. And then as you go, there's different security to keep in mind for the different components like data, compute, networking, monitoring prevention, internet and edge. So you really wanna keep in mind the different security services, tools or features along the way. But at the core, you do need to keep in mind this identity piece and then the rest kind of builds off of it as you um, build out your different services or resources. So it seems kind of like there's, you know, several different security kind of offerings and tools that you can take advantage of from different points in your technology stack kind of. I think that's what this slide is hinting at. So is there anything, Olivia, that you think is that we need to be like the most aware of? Are they all kind of equally just as important, or like you mentioned, like I know identity seems to be at the core. I was just wondering if you could kind of expand on on what your thoughts were on that. Yeah, this is all very important to keep in mind for each of these different components here. Once again, you know, at the very core, you want your identity placed. And that's one of the one things we're going to be focusing on because it's very important to keep in mind when you first get started or have been working in the cloud. So important to have that in place, but as you're building out your different services or resources, you also really, really do want to consider, you know, security for those as well. So they're all very important to keep, keep in mind, but this is going to kind of be your foundation and then you're going to be building off of it. Yeah, makes sense. All right. So compartments, um, as we saw in the Vision Corp slide, you have your root compartment right here. And this is just a logical way of grouping your resources. So if you're creating a resource like a compute instance, um, virtual cloud network, or any of the different resources, when you're creating in the console, you have to specify in which compartment is going to reside in. So it's very crucial that you organize in such a way um, that's good for your use case or the environment you're looking to build out. And so you'll see right here, so once again, you start out with that root compartment, but you can build out different sub compartments, which can be nested up to six levels. And so we have our Vision Corp compartment. You can have other compartments, maybe for marketing, um, infrastructure. So you can format it different ways. And then from there, as mentioned earlier, if you're trying to build out um, a compute instance, if you're trying to provision a database, you have to specify in which compartment that resource is going to reside. So very good to have this formatted. So you can do it by environment, you can do it by resource, so just kind of however you want, but good thing to keep in mind on how you want to structure your compartments. Another aspect of this is how you're granting permission for working with the different resources in this compartment. So this is policies, and we'll be talking a little bit more about that in a moment. But this is what this symbol means right here. And then this is just our compartment symbol. And then you also see there's different groups of admins managing the access or the policies for these different resources. And one best practice um, here is you want to have different groups of admins managing access to resources in these different compartments. So right here, we have an infrastructure admin group managing access to this infrastructure compartment. And then there's a shared service admin managing permission to the shared services compartment right here. And then we just have an overall identity access management or IAM admin here. And the reason why you wanna do this is you don't wanna have an admin, one admin group for a bunch of different compartments. You kinda of wanna separate it out 
you don't want any overlapping permissions. So you really just want to have different groups of admins who might be more familiar with infrastructure or ser shared services and the permissions needed there. So best practice, having different groups of, of admins here. All right, so that's just kind of an overview of compartments. Once again, just organizing your different resources. It also plays a key role in permissions. So we'll be kind of discussing that a little bit more. All right, so one thing to keep in mind um, is Oracle IAM or Identity Access Management Identity Domain. So Oracle recently merged Identity Cloud Service or IDCS into OCI Native IAM Service or OCI IAM. So we just kind of standardized on the OCI branding. So the updated service is now called OCI IAM. It's now a native service available in all 37 plus Oracle Cloud regions. And it's just going to add all the IAM features and functionality from IDCS natively into OCI. So features like strong multi-factor authentication or MFA, um, identity lifecycle management or SSO to third-party apps. But yeah, just one thing to keep in mind, and you may have already noticed this in your tenancy. Um, and if not, it just kind of depends on when you provision your tenancy, but this is overall the, the end goal. Yeah, so once again, um, we now have a unified IAM service that addresses the needs of OCI, Oracle apps, as well as third-party apps, which may be software as a service or SaaS running in the cloud or on-prem. And some of the benefits of the identity domain include easier identity service management and configuration. So instead of setting up different IDCS instances, and managing them outside the console, they will now be converted into identity domains accessible via the OCI console. Just overall improved OCI experience, so just having that single entry point. So multiple identity domains are useful when you need separate environments for a single cloud service or application. So for example, one environment for development and maybe one for production. And just having numerous options for multi-factor authentication or MFA, because MFA is enforced with um, identity domains. All right, so kind of going into identity access management and breaking it down, because this is very core to working with OCI. So in OCI, it's going to be denied by default. So you have to grant access to groups of users for permission for working with your different resources in those compartments. So first off, you have your users and you're gonna to want to add them to a group, maybe a networking group or a shared infrastructure admin group or however you're grouping out your users. And they have to be part of a group because permission is um, granted to groups, not specific um, users. So just wanna keep that in mind. You also have another type of um, group called dynamic groups. And this allows you to group um, OCI compute instances as principal actors, so kind of similar to user groups. And then you can then create policies to permit instances to make API calls against your different OCI services. Um, so you, you have your groups of users, but you can also do dynamic groups, so groups kind of of your compute instances. So you have those two different options there. And so once you have um, your groups, you can then um, draft policies um, to permit um, or grant access to those groups of users for working with um, different resources. And there's different types of permissions that you can grant or different levels. So we'll be kind of exploring that um, in the coming slides. Um, so can you talk a little bit about how I'm sure there's a lot of people on this um, webinar who maybe their organization already you know, uses um, an identity provider and they already have some some group set up um, with users as well. How would they be able to kind of, would they be able to import them into OCI and then maybe, um, you know, use like a single sign-on for uh, convenience? Can you talk a little bit about that process? Yeah, so OCI um, IAM is built on standards and allows you to federate your user directory in OCI. So your admins can federate with, 
a supported identity provider so that each employee can use an existing logon and password and not have to create a new set to use um, OCI resources. So you do have options with the uh, Federation there. Awesome, thanks. All right, so going a little bit more into policies or how you're going to be granting access. So you see you have your users and you've already added these users to groups right here. So you're granting access at that group level. Um, but first off, a policy is just a document that specifies who can access which OCI resources that your company has and how. So it simply allows a group to work in certain ways with specific types of resources in a particular compartment. And policies only allow access. They cannot deny it. So that's just one thing to keep in mind. An OCI is denied by default. You can only grant access with these policies. And you'll see it formatted right here. So you're allowing a group, so group A or group B, to a certain permission, so manage or list, or there's other types that you can allow as well. A certain resource in compartment um, A or compartment B. So that's essentially how it works. So allowing your groups to a certain permission for a certain resource in a compartment. So you mentioned that, um, you know, compartments can also run like six levels deep. So you can have, you know, several nested compartments within one. How would the policies work then? Um, wondering about kind of policy inheritance and um, for those groups of users. Yeah, so compartments inherit any policies from their parent compartment. So policies that apply to, let's say, a parent compartment resource or in compartment A also applies to resources in the subcompartment B and C. Um, so if you just only want to apply to a specific compartment or subcompartment, you would have to form it, format it that way. And we do have some documentation help with that, but they do inherit um, any policies from the parent compartment. So there's one thing to keep in mind with your, your subcompartments. Right. Um, so that is policies. And then let's just dive a little bit deeper into policy syntax right here. Um, so once again, you're allowing a group and there's different types of access. So if you just wanted them to be able to um, inspect, um, read, use, or manage, you can specify that right here. And one of the nice things when you're in the OCI console, if you're trying to draft a policy, um, it'll give you some common policy templates for the different resources. You could select that. And they also have a policy builder where you could um, edit the policy. So it really does help you build out your policies. And then they also do have different documentation for each of these different pieces right here. So, um, you know, for, man for the verb type, if you want more information on that, they link documentation there. Um, the different where conditions. So it's pretty, pretty nice to have that policy builder. It really helps you along the way if you didn't know what kind of permission um, you want to grant or some of the different features here. So it'll kind of walk you through that a little bit. Um, and then also, you know, there's certain resource types. So there's just some examples right here. And then also in a certain compartment, so project A, and then you can get a little bit more granular with your where conditions, but this is essentially how the policy syntax works. And there's a lot of documentation out there in the policy builder, once again, is pretty helpful for helping you draft the policy that you want. And so that kind of concludes the introduction part of OCI and identity access management. So kind of just some of the key terminology and getting started there. And with that, I'll pass over to Uma. So she'll be taking you through an overview of some of the different OCI services, like compute, networking, storage, and then also a demo. Awesome. Thanks, Olivia. Um, so yeah, I'll just be talking you guys through several different components of our main uh, infrastructure services. So we're going to start with networking, then we'll talk about compute, storage, and then end with database before giving you guys a quick console tour. So this just goes over some of the main components of the networking service that you're going to want to be aware of. So starting at the top left, that's going to be your actual network that you'll build out in OCI. It's called a virtual cloud network or a VCN for, uh, for short. Um, and so these are going to be software defined networks that you can deploy your instances within a specific set IP range. 
Um, and there's a lot of different components that go along with VCNs that we'll talk about, including subnets and communication gateways. I do also want to kind of talk about some of the connectivity options. So on the bottom right hand side, you'll see a symbol for fast connect. Um, so there's kind of multiple ways that you can connect up your on premise network to your resources in OCI. Um, and one of the ways to do that is by utilizing fast connect. So that gives you a dedicated private connection option for you to use. And you can choose kind of different uh, bandwidth levels and peering options when you set up this environment. It's also definitely a good idea to set up like a redundant connectivity option. So either a secondary fast connect or also utilize our VPN connectivity option as well. We also have load balancing service. Um, this is going to help you distribute traffic from a single entry point to multiple backend servers accessible within your VCN. You, were, you have the freedom to kind of configure different routing rules uh, to help assign traffic in different ways to these backends. So not only are you improving your resource utilization with load balancing, it also helps with instance scaling as well as ensuring that high availability within your architecture. And then, you know, there's multiple different types of gateways that you are essentially going to utilize when you are routing traffic to destinations outside of your VCN. So we'll talk a bit about um, the types of gateways you can um, create and use. And then our networking service also has a DNS service that you can leverage as well to kind of manage um, your different DNS zones. <laughs> So I'm actually just going to be walking you guys through building out an example architecture using this Vision Corp um, fictitious company that Olivia introduced earlier. Um, so we're just going to build out a simple three-tier web application on this architecture diagram, and then I'll kind of touch upon um, each of the different networking components as well as you know storage and, and compute once we get there. So the first thing, like I mentioned, that we're going to need to create is our VCN, so that software-defined private network. Um, it's going to very closely uh, resemble like a traditional network on-premise. So you'll have, you know, firewall rules and communication gateways that you want to make sure you're choosing. And a VCN will reside in a single Oracle cloud infrastructure region and can cover one or more CIDR block. You also want to kind of just be aware that um, when you are allowing your groups and users to create, um, you know, your virtual cloud network, you don't have to always um, grant them like the manage access, that permission, if you just want them maybe to update a, a specific component of that VCN. So let's say they just need to update a route rule in a route table or change an ingress or egress rule in a security list. Um, they don't need that sweeping access of manage. You can just give them the use access. Um, but you just want to be aware that, you know, even though they don't have manage access to the, your virtual cloud network, they can still kind of affect network behavior, right? Because they can still um, change different things um, when it comes to routing or security. Um, so it's just something to be aware of, of this kind of discrepancy, um, just to make sure that, um, you know, when you are assigning uh, your groups different permissions, you're just aware of what their capabilities are when it comes to networking. So once you have your VCN, this is when you can start creating your subnets, which are just gonna be subdivisions of your VCN. Um, so you can have one or more subnet in an AD for a given VCN, and these subnets can either be AD specific, um, or regional. So we have three subnets that we've created in this example, and they are all regional. So they're able to span um, a couple of different availability domains. You'll see here, they're spanning 82 and 83. Um, and we've done that again to help with the resiliency and the high availability um, as we build out the architecture. So each subnet will have a contiguous non-overlapping private IP space, and then you can designate them as either public or private when you create them. And so this, um, this designation is going to be essentially how your instances um, are going to draw their internal IP addresses from. So an instance placed in a private subnet will contain a private IP address assigned to their VNIX or their virtual network interface card, which is just kind of going to help enable how a compute instance connects to a VCN and will help determine how the instance connects with endpoints inside and outside the VCN. 
And then instances um, placed within a public subnet will contain both a private and public IP address assigned to their VNIC. So we have a couple of different subnets here. Um, we have a public subnet and then a couple of private subnets, maybe one for our application tier and then one for the data tier. And then I also do want to call um, out right here, we have some symbols um, for our route tables and security lists. So I just want to briefly go through kind of your different security options with networking. Um, with security uh, options, the virtual firewall options you have, you can choose from a security list or a network security group, or you can use both um, in tandem. A security list, essentially, you're just defining a set of security rules, and then you're applying all of those rules to all the VNIX in a subnet. So the security list will be associated with a particular subnet, and then all the instances or VNIX within that subnet have to adhere to any of those ingress or egress rules that you've defined, right? And a subnet can be associated with a maximum of five different security lists. Now within NSG, you're still defining your own security rules. So ingress and egress rules, you're, you know, um, you are going to specify um, the protocol, the destination, um, more information like that. But instead of assigning it to an entire subnet, you're simply going to assign it to a group of VNIX. Um, so you can kind of group together VNIX um, of your choice that need the same security posture and then attach them to that particular NSG. So then now, you know, all the VNICs in that NSG have to adhere to all of the security lists that you had defined when you created that NSG. Um, and a VNIC can be added to a maximum of five NSGs. So they do have those kind of limitations on them. So with network security groups and security, security lists, is it best practice to use them together, one or the other? What's the recommendation there? Um, so I think that really just depends on your architecture and your own requ application requirements. Um, I think it is recommended to use the NSGs because they go a bit more granular instead of being at the overall subnet level. You can actually, you know, pick and choose no matter where this, like which subnet, you know, your instances are in. Um, so it's more at the instance level. Um, and you can also use them in tandem, but there are definitely going to be some use cases where using an NSG isn't feasible. So that's why some customers will default to security lists. Um, I would say NSGs are going to give you more control, essentially, um, but it really is just dependent on um, your architecture and your your own kind of security requirements. Gotcha. So you can use them both, but those NSGs are going to allow you to be more granular, but it does depend on your, your use case as well. Yes, yes. So, um, okay. So then the next thing that I want to talk about too is our route tables. So a route table is going to be used to send traffic outside of a VCN. Um, so you'll define different route rules in which you're just specifying your destination cider as well as your target. And your target um, would be essentially one of the different communication gateways, right? That next kind of hop in traffic for, for um, that destination. So the main use case of using a routing table is sending um, a subnet's traffic to destinations outside of the VCN. Um, and once you have created your different route rules in that route table, it's going to be attached to a particular subnet or the entire VCN um, in general, and then all the instances within that subnet or VCN are going to um, adhere to those route table rules. So traffic within the VCN subnet is automatically handled by VCN local routing, so you don't have to um, worry about any kind of route rules or enable that traffic flow. It's going to be kind of automatically handled. Uh, but in general, you want to make sure that you're never specifying a destination cider that is um, either the VCN cider block or a subsection of it. Um, so you're always going to want to choose a destination cider that is outside of the VCN. All right. So that was a quick overview on security and routing. And then now we've added a few different communication gateways. Um, so I want to kind of talk about the different communication gateways that you can take advantage of in OCI. The first one is an internet gateway. You'll see we have one um, up next to the public subnet. So that is going to provide a path for network traffic 
between your VCN and the internet. Um, it is important to keep in mind that you can only have one internet gateway per VCN. So they do have a one-to-one -one relationship and you wanna make sure after you've created this uh, internet gateway, you're adding a route rule for it in your VCN's route table to actually enable that traffic flow. Now, if you wanted to also give access to the internet, maybe for hosts that do not have a public IP address, uh, so for those um, hosts in a private subnet, then you would use something called a NAT gateway. So it's essentially gonna do the same thing with the internet gateway does, except it's providing private network access. So you do not have to um, you know, assign that host a public IP address. So essentially hosts can initiate outbound connections to the internet and they can also receive responses, but they will not receive any inbound connections initiated from the internet. So maybe if you had some, um, some use cases would be like updates or patches for certain systems. Um, and you can have multiple NAT gateways on a VCN, but when you are utilizing it to actually route traffic, you can only route traffic uh, for a given subnet on a singular NAT gateway. The next type of communication gateway is a DRG. We don't actually have it on this screen, but I still kind of just want to inform you guys what a DRG does. Um, this essentially is going to give you a path for private traffic between your VCN and destinations other than the internet. So the main kind of use case we see DRGs being used is establishing um, a connection from your on-premise environment to OCI via um, VPN Connect or Fast Connect. You can also utilize DRGs if you want to peer two VCNs together. So have resources from two different um, virtual cloud networks communicate with each other Maybe they're in the same region, maybe they're in different regions. Um, either way to help enable that traffic flow, you're going to need to create that communication gateway, attach it to the proper VCN, um, and then, of course, add the proper route rules. And then the last type of gateway we have is our service gateway. Um, so this is, you can see here on the bottom right, of the screen, it's attached to our VCN. And this is really just going to let resources in your VCN communicate with different public OCI resources like object storage or analytics cloud without having to use an internet or NAT gateway. Um, so you are just staying on Oracle's um, backbone kind of network fabric. You're never traversing the public internet to access uh, these different services. All right. So now we've gone in and we've also added a load balancer to distribute some traffic. Um, and now we can go ahead and talk about um, where the traffic would go once um, it's pinged the load balancer. So that brings me to our next topic, which is gonna be the compute service. So the compute service will help you provision instances to meet you know, your different compute and application requirements. And I've been using the term instance a lot. Um, it basically just means a compute host. Um, and as we look at the screen from left to right, there is going to be a trade-off between user management and functionality. So we'll start off on the left-hand side. Um, you can choose between you know, virtual machines or VMs as, where, uh, as well as bare metal instances. Um, so with a bare metal instance, you get the full bare metal server with no noisy neighbors, and you will have some performance overhead. And it's mainly going to be uh, best used for like performance intensive workloads. You can also use this option if you don't need a hypervisor, or let's say you want to bring your own hypervisor. Um, this is also a good option to use. Now with a virtual machine, it's essentially using a hypervisor to virtualize that underlying bare metal server into smaller VMs. Um, there is an option with virtual machines uh, where you can run them on dedicated servers. I believe it's called dedicated virtual hosts. Um, and those will be single tenant. They're not shared with other customers, but they are different than a bare metal because there is a hypervisor, right? And with the virtual machine option, you do have a lot of flexibility in your shape and your image that you choose. Um, you know, the image being what you'll use to launch an, a, a, an instance. It also determines, you know, the operating system and other kind of software uh, as well. So we also have containers. Um, that's going to be, you know, your standard units of software that will package code and dependency for quick and reliable deployments. So um, it allows your applications to be more rapidly deployed, patched, and scaled. 
It also supports Agile and DevOps efforts to accelerate the dev test and production cycles. Um, so definitely going to want to use containers for any sort of microservices kind of based architecture. And in OCI, the container service also leverages a highly available Oracle managed private container registry, uh, which you can use kind of for storing and sharing different container images. Lastly, on the right, we have our function service, which is our serverless computing platform in which you do not have to worry about any of the underlying infrastructure. You're simply um, writing your code, um, deploying your function, and then calling it. And so there's a variety of, di of different kind of use cases that you can utilize functions for. Um, you can use it for ETL. You can use it to, um, you know, push uh, your audit logs to um, different tools. You can use it to just extend out your SaaS applications, um, have them perform quick actions for you. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that you can do with the function service, but you, pretty much all the in underlying infrastructure is completely abstracted from you. Um, so that's where you get kind of less of that uh, control and user management. So we can go ahead and add on to our architecture with some compute instances in our private subnet and they are receiving traffic from the load balancer. So how does the load balancer know which compute instance to send traffic to? How, how does that work? So when you create the load balancer, you also can choose a traffic distribution policy. Um, so by default, I believe it's the round robin. So it'll distribute traffic kind of in a circular uh, fashion. You can also do a least connections uh, traffic distribution policy in which, um, you know, the server with the least connections will be kind of the next um, target. Or you can also do an IP hash policy. Um, so you're able to choose that when you create the, the load balancer and your backends. Gotcha. So default round robin, but you can do least connections or, or IP hash. Yes, those are the three. All right. So now I also want um, to kind of just bring awareness to the different storage options um, that are available for you guys in OCI. It's really good just to kind of be aware of this. Um, once again, just so that you can choose kind of the best storage option for your own use case. Um, so on the left-hand side, we have local NVMe SSD. So that's going to provide the fastest performance for a transactional database or high performance uh, workloads. So best used for like OLTP, um, big data kind of use cases. And these are going to be those individual devices kind of locally installed um, on your uh, instance. There's also the file storage service. So that's going to offer a managed file storage uh, service that can scale up to exabytes. So it's great for any sort of enterprise applications, big data as well, um, or container-based applications. We also have block storage. So this is gonna be the most kind of flexible for application development and deployment, as well as any sort of classic tiered application. So this service essentially just lets you dynamically provision and manage different block volumes that you can attach and detach to your instances. So they're best for applications, you know, requiring SAN-like features like VMware, Oracle database based applications. And then lastly, we have our object storage. So this is gonna be kind of Oracle's main storage platform that can store an unlimited amount of unstructured or semi-structured data. Um, it can be of any kind of content type. So things like images, videos, logs, and there's two different like flavors, if you will, of object storage. We have normal object storage, which we sometimes refer to as hot storage and then archive storage, which is sometimes referred to as cold storage. So with archive storage, that's just our durable long-term data storage. It's a lot cheaper than normal object storage, but the data does need to be restored before you're able to retrieve and use it. Um, and with object storage, you can just instantaneously retrieve the objects and begin working with them. So now we've just added on some storage here and it's going to be accessed through our service gateway. So maybe we are using uh, an object storage bucket to store our um, database backups. Which brings me to our final um, kind of piece of the session, which is our database session. 
no, sorry, database services. Um, so there are kind of a lot of different database offerings and options that you have in OCI. And so we'll kind of go through them from the perspective of, you know, most customer managed to like least customer managed. And by that, I just mean it's more of the, um, you know, infrastructure and processes will be managed by Oracle or like the software itself. So on the left-hand side, we're looking at the more customer managed services like Oracle database running on compute. So um, with this service, um, you can, you know, run your database systems on single node, on either bare metal or virtual machines and a two node rack database system on a virtual machine. And you can manage these systems using the console, uh, the OCI REST API, um, the Oracle Cloud Infrastructure CLI, DB CLI, Enterprise Manager or SQL Developer. Um, and then you'll see you can choose to like enable data guard. It also has automated transparent data encryption at rest. And then for our more semi-managed um, services, we have Oracle Database Cloud Service, which this slide is a bit outdated. It's now called Oracle Base Database Service, um, as well as our Oracle Exadata services. Um, so with these options, you know, your IT teams have access to build, um, you know, dynamic business applications. They can increase their productivity with things like self-service database pr provisioning, as well as lifecycle automation. Um, so it makes it kind of easier for your DBAs to do things like create, patch, and manage your Oracle databases. Um, and you can see kind of the features that come with the different services. You can choose to enable Data Guard once again, as well as enable automated backup and patching um, with Oracle Exadata. That's going to be our kind of extreme performance database um, built specifically for the hardware uh, Exadata machine. And there's kind of also different deployment offerings that come along with that as well. And then for the last portion, um, that's going to be our fully managed database services. So that will essentially be the Oracle Autonomous Database. So this eliminates a lot of the complexities of operating and securing your Oracle databases. So um, it still gives you though really high levels of performance availability and scalability. Um, so a lot of the tasks that a DBA would typically spend time doing is actually taken care of by the software itself. So it's able to auto scale, auto tune, auto patch, um, a lot of different other things that the software is able to do. And it comes kind of with a lot of pre-baked um, services and actions that you can utilize, um, like our machine learning notebooks, our um, SQL developer web, as well as our Apex um, low code. Uh, application development tool. And there's also kind of several different flavors that you can choose from. So you can choose a data warehousing option, which is column optimized. So that's kind of best for your um, like analytic heavy workloads and transaction processing would be best for uh, your transactional workloads. And then we also do have like a JSON focused autonomous database as well as one uh, specific for Apex. And you can also choose different deployment options like shared infrastructure or dedicated. So now the final piece um, that we've just added on is our autonomous database in our database subnet. Um, and then maybe we're also kind of utilizing analytics cloud. Um, and for that, we would also be uh, possibly um, accessing that through the service gateway as well. All right, so just wanted to, again, kind of bring back the slide that Olivia mentioned in the beginning. Hopefully it makes a bit more sense how you can kind of look at this slide and see all the different offerings and how you can use them um, in tandem together to build out like an application um, or a workload on OCI. And so now I'm going to take you guys into the console and we'll do a brief um, just kind of overview of the console um, just so you guys can kind of get familiar with it. Um, but this essentially is the homepage when you log into OCI. There's just certain things that 
I want to bring to your attention. Um, so initially you'll see this kind of get started um, area with different links to services that essentially um, either you've pinned or is recommended based off of kind of what you've searched for before. We also have a few different like ways to just get started with OCI. So we have a few different quick starts, um, either pertaining to application development or database um, that you can use to set up like a quick deployment of something. And also a space where you can launch different resources. So whether that be um, setting up a BCN or load balancer, uh, or maybe an object storage bucket, you can also kind of get started quickly um, by launching a specific resource. And at the bottom, this gives you a lot of links to um, documentation and tutorials that um, will kind of help you just familiarize yourselves with OCI um, and the different offerings that we have as well. Also on the right-hand side, you can see some more information about your own tenancy. Um, you can view your health dashboard to make sure all your services are operational. Um, it will also give you kind of an estimation of cost savings opportunities. So that's based off of our um, Cloud Advisor recommendation engine. And then you can also just, you know, browse and kind of see um, what's kind of new in OCI. Um, I believe these will be like links to blog posts and, and what you can do. And then up here, I also wanted to kind of explain this top right um, section. So this is going to be our main home region that you'll see. So right now, all the instances that um, if I were to go ahead and create a resource, it would be in this Ashburn region. I can um, change my region depending on what I'm subscribed to. And then that will reflect, you know, what I'm creating, where I'm creating those specific resources in. Um, you need to subscribe to a region um, to be able to create a resource uh, in that particular region. So if you go down to manage regions, um, that will bring you to a place where you can see all the different OCI regions and then choose to subscribe to them um, depending on where you want to deploy your resources. Um, we also have this space and developer tools. So um, you can either access Cloud Shell or Code Editor. Um, so Cloud Shell essentially will bring up kind of an instance um, of your terminal, but it is already kind of loaded with your own credentials. Um, and it does have like a small amount of memory and storage that you can work with. And it comes kind of pre baked also with some important tools like the OCI CLI, um, I believe um, some other important kind of um, tools that you may wanna be working with quickly on Cloud Shell. Um, and a lot of the things that you can kind of work with or deploy from your own terminal, like locally, you can also do within Cloud Shell. Um, so whether that be like executing, um, you know, a, Python script or um, even Terraform files, you're able to kind of load that into code editor in Cloud Shell and execute from there. This place also just takes you to the announcements. So this will give you, um, depending, I need to choose one, um, on the service um, and kind of what's going on. It'll let you know if there's any kind of scheduled updates or maintenance. Um, things that you should be aware of within your tenancy. There's also a help button in which you can create, um, you know, a support request or SR for a particular service. You can also request a service limit increase um, if you find yourself hitting a, a, a limit for a particular um, service or resource. This changes your language that you're looking at. And then on profile, this is where you can um, access some more important information about your user in particular, as well as your tenancy. Um, so you'll see here that my user is federated. So um, it's federated with our um, IDP is IDCS. Um, I can see some more information about myself, as well as this is where I'd be able to um, add my API keys, generate authentication tokens, as well as secrets. Um, to be able to access different services as well. And then you also have your tenancy 
um, page. So you can find some important information like um, the uh, object storage namespace, as well as the OSID for your tenancy, uh, which may be needed, you know, if you're doing different things outside of the console. And then on the left-hand side, this navigation menu is going to be where you can essentially uh, look through um, all the different services and kind of see uh, the different options to go ahead and, and create any of these services. So it's kind of separated out by topic area you'll see here. So we went through storage earlier. We also have networking, database, analytics, observability and management, identity and security um, in our marketplace as well. You can also um, search in the search bar. It's a pretty powerful search bar. Um, you can search by, um, you know, the name of the specific resource or just what the resource is. Um, and you can also utilize different things like Tenancy Explorer to be able to kind of search through the different compartments and see what has been created in each compartment. Um, so that kind of brings us to time. Oh, there's one is um, how and where can you obtain audit logs? Um, so your audit logs are going to be under the observability and management section. There's a logging section, and then we have audit um, under here. And this is where you'd be able to search for audit um, and kind of see based off of user what's been happening. Add configure distribution email for any product or maintenance updates. So I believe that would be in the announcements section. Um, well, when you, whoever is the tenancy owner essentially would get all the announcements um, and you'd be able to view them from, from the screen. So for your teams, Lynn or Olivia, do you guys know? I think right here you can create like a subscription um, in which you probably use a notifications topic. Okay, so you can use our notification service essentially to do that. Um, you create a topic and then your subscriptions could just be like a list of emails and then you would uh, configure it on here. Um, so I could create a new topic and then add my different email addresses. And then I could create an announcement subscription here and then either get all the announcements or just like certain announcements. Um, is there a way to see who's accessing a tenancy currently? Um, that would be either utilizing the audit logs to see if there had been any, like the audit logs essentially is going to record like every single click made in the console um, or um, if you just want to see who, who has access, then that would be on the user's page. So that would be under identity and security in users. How can you get a report of security groups users in each group? and access provided to each group slash user. So, Olivia, do you know if there's a way to generate a report or would it just be under the policies where they would be able to see that? So there's a tool called Access Governance. So I was just gonna link that in the chat. I'm not sure if that's what you're looking for, but it kind of helps with visibility by reviewing access based on users, applications, cloud resources, or policies. So I'll link that in the chat if you, um, Want to learn more about that. So, okay, great. There. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Uma and Olivia. Uh, thanks for taking extra time to answer those questions. And thanks to Lynn as well for reading those questions in the QA channel. I think it was a great session, and I'm sure everyone learned something new today. With that, uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. We'll see you all next time.